Hello again, this is Information Service Engineering Lecture number 5, Natural Language Processing, part 4. In this part of the lecture, we are going to talk about part of speech tagging. So what are we going to do? We try to determine the category of words and we want to put words into a common category which have similar grammatical properties. So usually words that are assigned to the same word part of speech generally display similar behavior in terms of syntax. Moreover, part of speech tagging is a prerequisite for many NLP applications. So what we are talking about, part of speech also is referred to as lexical category, word classes, morphological classes or similar. And it's a rather old thing. So since we are talking about grammatics, people are trying to put words into common categories. And this dates back to a guy named Dionysius Trux of Alexandria. So he lived from around 170 BCE to 90 BCE and he was a grammarian and a pupil of famous Aristarchus of Samothrake, who is also a famous grammarian and was one of the librarians in the library of Alexandria. So this Dionysius Trux is considered one of the earliest authors of a grammatical text of the Greek language. And this was used as a standard manual for perhaps some 1500 years or so. And until recently, it was regarded as the groundwork of the entire Western grammatical tradition. And this guy already described eight parts of speech. So what he was describing were nouns, verbs, pronouns, prepositions, adverbs, conjunctions, participle and article. And of course, we are still keeping these categories today. So let's have a, word, uh, a look at a few sample word classes. And of course, we are talking about the English language here. So nouns, what is a noun? You all know what a noun is. I mean, you know this from el elementary school. So that's a word that functions as the name of something specific or a set of things. So for example, living creatures, objects, places, actions, qualities, and so on and so on. And we distinguish between proper nouns, which are names of specific entities like me, I'm Harald, or I live in Karlsruhe, so a specific city. I teach at KIT, you know this already. And besides proper nouns, there are also so-called common nouns. So this is a noun which refers to a class of entities. So in general, a city, a planet, person, corporation, these are common nouns. And with common nouns, we again distinguish so-called count nouns. These are nouns that allow enumeration so that I can say one dog, two dogs, one city, two cities, and there are mass nouns, which means these are so-called conceptualization of homogeneous groups, like for example, you can't count snow, heat, salt. So it doesn't make sense to say one snow, two snow, three snow. So these are mass nouns, just as a distinction. Okay, between nouns or um, besides nouns, Next, more, uh, next most important class here are verbs. Of course, you also know about verbs. Verbs, verbs are words that are referring to actions, processes, occurrences, state of being, and so on. And we distinguish here between main verbs, which provide the main semantic sentence of a clause, like for example, the dog ate my homework, typical sentence that you hear as a teacher, or auxiliary verbs. What are auxiliary verbs or auxiliaries? They usually add functional or grammatical meaning to a clause in which it appears such as to express <coughs> tense, aspect, modality, voice or emphasis and something like that. So a typical auxiliary is do. So do you want T with which you can, for example, express a question like here? Okay. Next among the word classes, there are adjectives. What are adjectives? Adjectives further describe or modify and give more information about nouns or about pronouns. So like, for example, big, happy, green, young, fun, and so on and so on. And talking about pronouns, what were pronouns? A pronoun is used in place of a noun or a noun phrase simply to avoid repetition. So, you know, I, you, we, they, he, she, it, and so on. These are pronouns. <coughs> And they are used to, to uh, let's say, to avoid the use of, let's say, a proper noun where you exactly talk about sp a specific person or a specific thing. 
Okay, so examples for most common POS tags, and here are a few more. For nouns, for example, book, books, nature, Germany, Sony, verbs, clearly eat, write, wrote, so different tenses, of course, they are all verbs. Auxiliaries are besides do, also can, should, have. Adjectives, new, newer, newest, you see, you can also here um, have a comparative and a superlative. So this is uh, an emphasis then here in the adjective. Then there are adverbs, well, urgently, so they further describe a verb. Numbers, of course, are also distinct. Then articles or determiners, the, some, a, an. Then we have conjunctions to put things together and or. We have the pronouns already talked about. Then there are prepositions, to, in, on, and stuff like that. There are particles, of, up. There are interjections, au, i, u. So just as an example for more part of speech text that are available. Okay, before we go deeper into determining how we actually can compute or approximate part of speech text, we have to take a look on how do languages change and evolve. And there we distinguish between two different classes of words. There are closed word classes, which of course here, uh, these closed words. This is a limited, usually, number of words. Usually these classes do not grow because in a language, all of these words that belong to these classes are already defined, like auxiliaries, articles, determiners. You see, it doesn't make sense to invent a new determiner or to invent a new conjunction. These things usually already exist in language. Function words, for example, also. So here are some classes um, which are closed classes, like for example, prepositions, particles, determiners, pronouns, conjunctions, auxiliary verbs, or numerals. On the other hand, we have so-called open word classes. And these classes might contain an unlimited number of words because you can always invent new words and let's say compose new words. And there, these classes are nouns, verb, adverbs, or adjectives. There you can invent something new for something, you know, which now enters the world and which did not exist, let's say, a few years before. To see this again in a kind of graphics, you have here <coughs> open classes and closed classes, as you see here, and examples for some of the word types and classes and how they are distributed and to which they are belong to. Okay. So we have closed classes, which means these words you usually find in a typical dictionary, and open classes, which means there might be words that you can't find in a dictionary. However, in a part of speech dagger, we have to determine what's the part of speech. So what type of word is it? Even we don't know it. And this distinction here already helps us because it's much more unlikely if you have an unknown word that it belongs to a closed class, then it belongs then an open class, which makes sense. Okay, so we have seen already several types, several part of speech classes, and then there have been defined some tag sets of, with which you usually then tag a corpus. So you annotate, tagging is nothing else but annotating a word with its class. And um, in, let's say, the history of corpus linguistics, uh, and uh, natural language processing, different kind of tag sets have been developed, which of course also are dependent on different languages, because in different languages you might need, let's say, a finer granularity. However, there is, for example, uh, the brown corpus tag set. So the brown corpus, this is a corpus that has been uh, put together already in the, in the mid 1960s, which consists of around 1 million words of running English prose text. And um, for that, th this has been, of course, accurately tagged with part of speech. And there in uh, 1982, they published also uh, a paper where they uh, defined 87 part of speech tags, the brown tag set. There are other tag sets, C5, C7 tag set, where you see uh, they differ here in numbers. And today, let's say the most commonly, most popular tag set that is used is the Pen tree bank 
text set. So in linguistics, a tree bank, you should know that is kind of a past text corpus that annotates syntactic or semantic sentence structure. So this was in the uh, mid 1990s and these kind of already annotated uh, tree bank text corpora, they um, revolutionized computational linguistics in that sense. There are also in 1993, um, um, a simplified version of the Brown text that has been uh, published with 45 texts. So that's the most popular and only to give you a hint that there are text sets which are much larger here for the break dependency uh, tree bank data set. So this is Jack. Um, there you have, for example, 4,452 tags. So be glad that you don't have to remember all of them. However, now when we are going to tag or do POS tagging, we are using now the pen tree bank tag set. So these tags, you see them here in a um, brief aggregation. They are a bit more complicated than the few, let's say around 10 tags we have already, or classes we have already uh, learned of. So what you see here, for example, for the nouns, you see here, you, you have a noun, NN, which is a, a singular noun or mass noun. Then you have plural nouns, NNS. Then you have proper nouns, NNP and you have proper noun plural, which would be NNPS and so on. So they have fine grain distinctions of the word type here. And the same is also for the verb, for the verbs, for example, you see here, you have a base form VB, you have a verb past tense, this is VBD, you have a gerund, you have a past participle and so on. So this is a finer distinction, which gives you even more than information about, you know, the class to which the word belongs to. And from that, you can derive already some meaning, some semantics of that kind of tag. Okay, this is the tag set. The goal that we now have is we want to see a sentence, read the sentence and then assign to each of the single words its POS tag. So what exactly is the type of the word we are looking at? So a POS tagger works in the following way. We have as input, a set of text, so this can be here our uh, tree bank te text set, and we have a raw text. And the output then should be, as I told you, a tag text where each of these words then is annotated with a tag. So for example, Ernest M, that's the guy the text is talking about, this would be a proper name. He is 61 years old and 61 would be here a numeral, for example. Years is again a noun and it's plural, old, it's an adjective, JJ. So this is not really intuitive, you have to learn this. However, of course, as we give you here only an introduction, you will see what type that is. You don't have to learn all these 45 texts for this lecture, so don't worry about that. But you see what exactly the task is. We want to derive an algorithm that is able exactly to achieve this kind of POS tagging. Okay. So POS tagging, we can now define as being the process of assigning a part of speech to each word within a text. You might say this is easy. It's not, since we know this already, as natural language, of course, is challenging. We are dealing again also with the POS tags with ambiguity. So where can it be ambiguous? Look at the following examples. Here, for example, on my back, Back is a noun. The back door, it's an adjective. Win the voters back, that's an adverb. Promised to back the bill, suddenly it's a verb. So you see you have here a high degree of ambiguity and you have to determine, yeah, what does it depend on that this word back is now a noun, an adjective, an adverb or a verb. You might already think of that, so probably it's dependent on, you know, what's the word before and the word after, or what's the type of the word before and the word after. You see, there are some dependencies. So for example, we know already when there is a determiner like the, the word after the might be either an adjective or it might be a noun. And if it's an adjective, then it's hi highly likely that after the adjective, then for example, a noun follows. These kind of rules might be really, really, let's say, um, important. 
the typical output then one of, of a POS tagger, as you saw it on the example before, is then after each word, you have then an annotation of exactly the POS tag. So what type of word is it then? Why are we doing that? Of course, POS tagging, as I already told you, might be or might serve as a prerequisite for further analysis. What kind of analysis? So for example, in speech synthesis, you might not realize this, but how do you pronounce lead or lead? Insult or insult? Object or object? Overflow or overflow? So you see, depending on what syllable you hear pronounce is of course dependent on the type of word, so on the POS tag. So what type of word, what category is it? And then these words suddenly have different kind of pronunciation. So this of course has to be considered for speech synthesis. Also in parsing, you know, what words are in a sentence? And of course, a unique tag to each word would reduce the number of required parses that you need then to parse a sentence anyway. Or also for information extraction, if you want to try to find names in a sentence, if you want to find or identify relations in a sentence, as well as for machine translation. So for example here, if you have the same string content, if it's a noun, it has a different translation than if it's content, the adjective. So you have to know the type of word for machine translation, for example, to determine you know, what's the correct translation. So you see part of speech tagging is kind of useful. And how we are going to do that, how this in principle works, I will tell you in the next part of the lecture when we do part of speech tagging number two.